Hot on the heels of the RTX 3080 launch last week, NVIDIA is now launching the RTX 3090. They are available for sale starting today at $1,500 and up, and reviews like mine are also going live. I did some testing with this MSI Gaming X Trio version of the RTX 3090, but there are also Founders Edition cards out there, as well as other third-party designs. It's pretty much a given that this is now going to be the fastest gaming graphics card on the market, but how much faster is it than the RTX 3080 from last week? or the RTX 2080 Ti flagship from last gen. Also, who the heck is this card even actually made for? Allow me to explain. Excellent! Team Group's Dark Z series of DDR4 gaming memory features an aggressive yet stylish armored design with high performance aluminum alloy heat sinks to keep thermals in check. The Dark Z series uses specially selected high quality modules to achieve DDR4 speeds up to 3600 with XMP 2.0 support for easy setup and kits are available in capacities of up to 32 gigabytes per DIMM, perfect for a gaming PC or a high-end workstation. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. So as usual, feel free to jump ahead for the benchmark numbers in this review, but I think there's some important things to consider with this card over just the raw gaming performance. Is this a gaming graphics card even? Well, I would say yes. MSI even calls their version the Gaming X Trio, but it is also a card built for creative workflows. And I think you could argue that it's a content creation card first and a gaming GPU second, but that's because I've already seen the 1080 and 4K benchmark numbers, and also because I don't have an 8K display to test, high resolution being one of the things that uses much more VRAM, and hence that is the reason why with 24 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM, this GPU can actually play at resolutions like 8K 7680x4320, whereas GPUs with less memory simply can't. One thing is for sure though, this card does not have the word Titan in the name, meaning, among other things, that NVIDIA is allowing third-party designs from AIB partners like MSI, something that they do not allow with Titan class cards. Historically though, NVIDIA has segmented their gaming GPUs as GeForce cards and their dedicated workstation class cards as Quadro cards, which are extremely expensive when compared to their GeForce counterparts. Quadro workstation class cards are meant to be used for work, and therefore they have an entire support structure that comes along with the hardware, including driver optimizations for professional software titles that are also very expensive because they're used for work to make people money. When the first Titan card launched back in 2013, it included Quadro type features, such as much more VRAM than GeForce class GPUs, and also that ever important software support for professionals. Anecdotally, I was still working at Newegg when the OG Titan launched, and I remember hearing that they were actually selling more of them than they expected given the price of $1,000 at the time, including to buyers from universities and research labs where presumably they would be using the cards for work and not for gaming. Even more directly though, here's Nvidia's statement on Titan cards from the RTX 3090 reviewer's guide. The demand for Titan from creators surprised us. These creative use cases needed the additional memory that Titan cards provided, but didn't necessarily need the additional professional application optimizations that Titan offered. The RTX 3090 is an ideal solution for content creators who need massive amounts of GPU memory, but don't require the additional professional software optimizations found on Titan and Quadro GPUs. So to answer that positioning question, who is this card made for? One type of customer would be that content creator who is working with 8K video and DaVinci Resolve or building highly detailed 3D models and animations with Blender. Open source software like Blender has become incredibly powerful, but it can also be incredibly resource hungry. So you could see how 24 gigabytes of VRAM and 10,496 Ampere CUDA cores in a $1,500 RTX 3090 might appeal to someone whose alternative is a $4,000 plus Quadro card, especially if with the Quadro card, you're paying for professional software support for titles that you have no intention of ever actually using. But then there's the other customer who will also be seeking out this card, who I think NVIDIA did also originally tap into with the launch of the original Titan back in 2013. These are PC gamers with disposable income or the willingness to add to their credit card debt who just have to have the best gaming graphics card available. NVIDIA also acknowledges this customer in the review guide with phrases like, who is the RTX 3094? It's for those who want the absolute best, the best GPU for demanding content creation, and for those who chase the pinnacle of gaming performance. It defies traditional cost analysis and isn't for typical on a budget gamers. It's for those who need a GPU for work and for bragging rights. I interpret the phrase defies traditional cost analysis as 
We know this card is very expensive. We don't really care because the RTX 2080 Ti did okay at $1,200 to $1,600, and we think that the people who are buying this card won't have a problem with the price either. And that may or may not apply to you. But let's talk about today's review because I kind of made it for that second group of potential customers, the pure gamers who want the best. I have 4K and 1080 benchmarks, the same set that I ran for the RTX 3080, and I will readily admit that this GPU deserves further testing beyond those standard game tests. 8K, 7680 by 4320 TVs with HDMI 2.1 are already available, and while I'd personally prefer higher frame rates at 4K and lower resolutions, it is a use case where this card shines, thanks to the 24 gigs of GDDR6 memory. I do have some DLSS tests at 4K, but it's even more helpful at 8K when 60 FPS is still very hard to achieve. And then of course there's the non-gaming capabilities of this card for content creation software testing, and I do plan to do a separate follow-up video on that for stuff like Octane Render, Maya, DaVinci Resolve, and Blender. These are all pitched by NVIDIA as seeing excellent gains with a 3090, but I simply need more time for that testing. I should have more time soon. Personally, we are still in the midst of a pretty significant transition in how we run things here in the Paul's Hardware household, so thank you again for your support and your patience. But for those of you who are purely gamers and who have $1,500 burning a hole in your pocket, but don't have an 8K TV or a need to edit 8K footage in DaVinci Resolve, what gains will you actually see from the RTX 3090? Let's find out. Now the RTX 3090 definitely looks impressive from a raw specs standpoint with its 24 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM and 10,496 ampere CUDA cores. It also features SLI support, the only card in the 30 series to sport two-way SLI with a new NVLink SLI bridge for the 30 series this time around too. And it is also a bit more power hungry than the 20 series GPUs with a total GPU power threshold of 350 watts. I am using the same test bed setup from the RTX 3080 launch last week, and I'll be comparing the RTX 3080 Founders Edition, the Asus ROG Strix OC RTX 2080 Ti, the original RTX 2080 Founders Edition, the Asus ROG Strix OC GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, the Galax EX OC Sniper GTX 1070, and the AMD Radeon RX 5700 XT reference card. The test bed here features the Ryzen 9 3950X running at 4.4 to 4.7 gigahertz with auto OC and PBO enabled, cooled by the NZXT Kraken X62 280 millimeter all-in-one CPU cooler. Here are the stats for the rest of the system if you want to take a look. And here are the actual clock speeds I was seeing out of the cards while in use. The RTX 3090 default boost clock is 1,695 megahertz. The MSI Gaming X Trio here bumps that up to 1,785 megahertz, and under sustained load, it leveled out at around 1,890 megahertz with the manufacturer out of the box overclock. And now, here are the benchmarks. So there are your gaming comparisons at 4K and 1080, and yes, I absolutely feel a little silly benchmarking this card at 1080 where many of the games are CPU limited. Again, I'm working with limited time and I wanted to provide you comparisons to the cards from last week, so I stuck with that setup for better or for worse. Speaking of the same tests from last week though, here are some ray tracing tests and DLSS at 4K for Metro Last Light and Battlefield 5. 
In the Port Royal Synthetic Ray Tracing benchmark from 3 d Mark, the 3090 showed a 20% improvement over the RTX 3080 and a 50% improvement over the RTX 2080 Ti. So I guess this means with an average frame rate of over 60 FPS, Port Royal is now playable with an RTX 3090. Enabling the Ray Tracing Ultra settings in Battlefield 5 brings the 3090's frame rate down to about 119 FPS at 1080p versus 156 FPS with it off. That's about a 24% performance hit. Overall with Ray Tracing on at 1080, the 3090 was 10% faster than the 3080 and 33% faster than the 2080 Ti. At 4K, the RTX 3090's frame rate dropped about 45% with ray tracing turned on, down to 63 FPS. For overall performance with ray tracing on, the 3090 was 21% faster than the 3080 and 56% faster than the 2080 Ti, showing that the performance gap is much more significant at 4K, as expected. For Metro Exodus, with ray tracing on at 1080p, the RTX 3090's frame rate dropped about 20%. Overall, the 3090 was just 2.5% faster than the 3080 here and 12% faster than the 2080 Ti, again showing that 1080p is really not what this card was designed for. With ray tracing on at 4K, the RTX 3090's frame rate dropped about 38%, down to 47.4 FPS. Overall performance in this test showed the 3090 was 21% faster than the 3080 and 58% faster than the 2080 Ti. Finally, here's a look at DLSS performance at 4K for Battlefield 5 and Metro Exodus. DLSS can be enabled without ray tracing, but for this test, I wanted to see how many frames could be clawed back with DLSS turned on. So for Battlefield 5, the 3090 was able to go from 63.1 FPS with pure ray tracing to 80.2 FPS with DLSS and ray tracing. That's about a 27% bump. And it made me want to see what the DLSS difference would be at 8K. So I guess I'll have to get an 8K TV soon or something like that. Here are the Metro Exodus ray tracing plus DLSS results as well though, where the RTX 3090 had 45% more frames with DLSS turned on versus just ray tracing alone. Again, a very nice bump for 4K gamers who want all the eye candy that's available. Now, before we close things out, here are the peak temperatures recorded for each card across all tests. My MSI Gaming X Trio RTX 3090 hit 75 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good, but if you want some more in-depth thermal testing, I am planning to compare third-party RTX 3080 models soon, and I'll also add in the 3090. Here are my power draw numbers, and again, this is a more power-hungry GPU than past models, using 60 to 65 watts more than the already power-hungry RTX 3080 on average, and that's for the entire system, and about 125 watts more than an RTX 2080 Ti. Here are my overall numbers, though evenly weighted by game, using the RTX 2080 Ti as the 100% baseline. I separated the 1080p and 4K numbers again because at 1080, it's pretty evident that we are CPU limited. Ultimately though, the 4K numbers show the greatest disparity, and there you have just shy of a 50% performance improvement over the RTX 2080 Ti and a 20% increase over the RTX 3080. Now in this chart, you can also see the pricing of each GPU relative to the weighted performance numbers, and I have to admit that this layout is a little bit more useful when the GPU prices are more reasonable, as in sub $800. Since the 3090 goes all the way up to $1,500 here, the percentage scale difference looks pretty small, but I included it nonetheless. So should you spend $1,500 on an RTX 3090? Well, can you even do that? Price and availability is a big question right now, even with a card purported to sell for $1,500 to $1,800 plus for some of the third-party models. Based on the 3080 launch, I would expect them to be pretty scarce at first, and we will continue to watch stock and pricing in coming weeks to see if Nvidia can meet demand and keep these GPUs at their already exorbitant MSRPs. Availability aside though, for most gamers, this will remain a Halo product that you probably don't need, even if you want to game at 4K. And that's okay, I think, because again, assuming you can find one to buy, the RTX 3080 meets the needs of most high-end gamers right now, and it might even have some big Navi competition from AMD's Radeon team soon to make things more interesting. The 2080 Ti's $1,200 price premium was often justified due to the 30 to 40% performance boost it provided over the RTX 2080, but the 3090 is more like 20% faster over the 3080, maybe 25, depending on what you're testing. So for those who just want the best, it might still be worth it, but for anyone who is weighing the price to performance, you'll probably be better off saving 800 bucks, give or take, and going with the RTX 3080. Too bad we can't spend that price difference on another 3080 and SLI them this time around, right? That, that kind of sucks. 
maybe it was intentional. So that is my launch review of the NVIDIA RTX 3090 represented by MSI's Gaming X Trio card. I didn't mention it, but it's a big and beastly card. It's got some nice RGB accents on there for RGB fans, and it has MSI's Tri-Frozer 2 thermal solution with a triple fan cooler. I don't have the Founders Edition 3090 to compare it to, but hopefully I will get one soon and I can do some further coverage on that. I will post links as I can find them to the RTX 3090 if it's available for sale, as well as other important stuff down in this video's description. And let me know in the comments if you plan to pick up an RTX 3090 for real, uh, and again, if you can find one, or if you're holding out for those big Navi announcements expected at the end of October. That's all for this video, guys. Closing reminder to check out my store at paulsharbar.net for merchandise, uh, shirts, pint glasses, other cool stuff to buy, and of course, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video on your way out. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already, and we'll see you guys in the next one.